আসসালামু আলাইকুম আমি ডক্টর আসিফ নেওয়াজ বেইলিজ এন্ড লাভ 27 এডিশনের ধারাবাহিকতায় যে সেশনগুলো চলছিল অ্যাজ দ্য সেশন দ্যাট অন গোয়িং ফর এফ সি পি এস এন্ড ইউনিভার্সিটি এস প্রিপারেশনস সো ফর দি অ্যাজ ফলোস দ্য নেক্সট টপিক ইজ এ নিউট্রিশন অ্যান্ড দ্য ফ্লুইড ম্যানেজমেন্ট ইউ অল নো দ্যাট ইজ দি ম্যানেজমেন্ট অফ ফ্লুইড অ্যান্ড ইলেকট্রয়েড ইজ ভেরি মাচ এসেনশিয়াল ফর এভরি those who are in the hospital acquired patient or the patient of nothing for oral and or others so maintaining fluid is very important because uh, 60% of our body weight uh, composed of fluid that is uh, the fluidity of the body and all the metabolic process and the other metabolic uh, reaction that depends on the fluid amount or the fluid uh contents that present in the body so that follows i i'm dr asif assistant registrar of surgery army medical college bogra so i'm going to uh show you the process and step uh, of learning from the bailey's and lab 27 edition okay so let's start there is fluid and elect and the nutrition therapy okay nutrition and fluid therapy so here you can see a patient uh, of a very much cachectic patient you can see and there is a scar mark that means it is a post operative period of a patient but uh, he is suffering from a severe starvation okay an elderly patient so what are the responses that occurs in a starving condition like metabolic response to starvation so there is a summary box of bellies and lobs that is made of some key points or uh, that seemed its a uh, response of starvation like the low plasma insulin high plasma glucagon so there uh, as a there is a lack of glucose or lack of that is supplementations of carbohydrate so there is uh, a little role of plasma insulin so plasma insulin level becomes low high plasma glucagon due to the absence of glucose the body needs or the brain or nervous system needs a instant glucose so glucagon level must be raised due to uh, increased carbohydrate concentration now the hepatic gluconeoglycogenolysis that means the glucose which is star which is uh, present in the liver uh, as a storage so in case of starving condition in case of np or nothing for oral or um, that glycogen must be converted into glucose for metabolism and the protein catabolism you can see the protein catabolism here the this patient has a severe catabolic phase you can see uh, his muscle become washed out Uh, the fat becomes more or less severely a uh, little amount that is already been uh, utilized or catabolized which is nothing but a protein catabolism now the hepatic gluconeogenesis what is the meaning of gluconeogenesis gluconeogenesis means the carbohydrate from the non carbohydrate precursors that means uh, in in this patient he has a little amount of a little amount of uh, dietary source of carbohydrate but he has a different uh, amount of non carbohydrate precursors like amino acid like fatty acid these are not the carbohydrate but some metabolism can convert these amino acid or non carbohydrate elements fat that can turns into the uh that can turns into glucose that is called the hepatic gluconeogenesis now the lipolysis lipolysis is the mobilization of fat stores or increase fat oxidation overall decrease in protein and carbohydrate oxidation. you can see this patient has a less amount of fat or the patient is underwent a severe lipolytic process so lipolysis that is mobilization of fat stores he this patient has a less amount of fat so, so that means increase fat oxidation overall decrease in protein and carbohydrate oxidation and 
adaptive ketogenesis we all know that the fatty acid has some end product that means acetone acetoacetate and bitter hydroxy butyrate so these are the ketones which is derived from a fat source or the ultimate derivatives of cholesterol okay now the reduction in the resting energy expenditure from the approximately 25 to 30 kilocal per kg per day to 15 to 20 kilocal per day that means the resting energy expenditure is reduced from 25 to 15 or minimum 10 so these are the metabolic response to starvation okay now the if the patient is on trauma that is any injury that may be surgery that may be acute inflammation that may be malignancy that may be uh, any road traffic accident or limb loss or fracture or any fall from height or on a, any case of obstructive features so all are the causes metabolic response to trauma and sepsis so they are the trauma and sepsis so what are the changes that occurs in the body like increased counter regulatory hormones that means there are some endocrine effect that means adrenaline which is life saving hormone become increased and noradrenaline also as well cortisol which is a stress hormone that means trauma and sepsis is a stressful condition so cortisol become increased and the glucagon and the growth hormone becomes increased increase uh, energy requirement up to the 40 kilocal per day okay so in case of trauma or sepsis body needs a, a extra energy to conserve to give support to the patient now increase the nitrogen requirement so they need a uh, more protein or more protein related diet or supplement because they need many uh, increased uh, nitrogenous requirement now the insulin resistance and glucose intolerance so the trans uh, so the patient with trauma or sepsis has uh, insulin resistance we all know that first 24 to 48 hours of surgery or any stress brings the insulin resistance in that case hyperglycemia is evident so insulin resistance is a temporary process of trauma and sepsis but it, uh, but it is not it, it must not gone through as well or we must not let that happen for a long time because it will it will invite a diabetogenic process okay now the glucose intolerance because as the insulin is the resistance the glucose become intolerant now the preferential oxidation of lipid so there is a more lipid oxidation or lipolysis and increased uh, gluconeogenesis and the protein catabolism so they have increased gluconeogenesis and protein catabolism loss of adaptive ketogenesis that means a lot of ketone bodies will form but there is no adaptation okay fluid retention with associated hyperalbuminemia so there may be a uh, fluid retention or edema occurs that uh, that in the from the previous lectures we all know that that uh, f phase and flow phase there are two phases of response so f phase is the initial phase or shock like state and the flow phase there is a point that is tissue edema so these are the avoidable factors that we can avoid uh, for from any surgery or any trauma so tissue edema is occurs due to hypoalbuminemia and the fluid retention due to the ex fluid retention as we all know that the exudative fluid can be present due to inflammation so excess inflammation brings a lot of fluid in the extracellular space that can causes tissue edema okay so beg your pardon okay how can we assess the nutritional status so how can we assess that a patient need a uh, patient is in poor status poor nutritional status or well nutritional status so there are some techniques that we usually use like the laboratory techniques okay so so there are some techniques that we are regularly used 
to assess the nutritional status. There is the laboratory, some, some are laboratory techniques, body weight and anthropometry, fluid and electrolytes, monitoring feeding regime or the process of the management of uh, fluid with their regimes and the macronutrients requirement. So, there are some uh, key elements that we are using added with the fluid that is macronutrients. Okay. Okay, sorry for the convenience. Okay. The laboratory techniques. So, there is no single biochemical measurement that reliably identifies any malnutrition. So, there is no definitive laboratory test that we can identify the patient is on malnourished or not. So, albumin is not a measure of nutritional status or particularly in the acute settings. Although a low serum albumin level is an indicator of poor prognosis and the uh, and prior prognosis and as well as the so although the low serum albumin level less than 30 gram per liter is an indicator of poor prognosis so serum albumin level if that is less than 30 it is a poor prognostic indicator and now the hypoalbuminemia inv invariably occurs because of alteration of the body fluid compositions and because of increased capillary permeability relating to ongoing sepsis that i already told you that in case of inflammatory response there is a lack of albumin that is hypoalbuminemia. In that case, fluid becomes uh, fluid that comes from the vascular to endovas uh, extravascular space that means uh, extracellular space or they it will causes edema or anasarca generalized edema. So, measurement of lymphocyte count skin testing for delayed hypersensitivity frequency reveal abnormal to the malnourished patient. Sometimes delayed hypersensitivity reaction can occur in the malnourished patient because uh, we can see because of TB or in case of any disease or opportunistic infection that can uh, causes as a result of delayed hypersensitivity like tuberculosis. So, me measurement of lymphocyte count, lymphocyte count is a uh, indicator of immunity. Sometimes lymphocyte count is reduced in case of malnourished patient and the skin testing for delayed hypersensitivity like Montu test, Montox test, Mentox test that is inf invariably or infrequently occurs in case of diagnosis of TB. Okay, now the body weight and anthropometry. Here you can see a simple method of assessing nutritional status is to uh, estimate weight loss. And the unintentional weight loss is of more than 10 percent of the patient weight in the preceding six months is a good prognostic indicator of poor outcome. That means, if a patient's body weight is lost 10 percent within six months, so it is uh, moreover uh, is a good indicator of a poor prognosis of a weight loss. That means, if the patient has some pre-existing diseases or some uh, factors that uh, that uh, leads to a massive weight loss. So, here you can see a uh, BMI the basal metabolic rate which is more than 20 18.5 to 20 and less than 18.5 that means if uh, that is uh, BMI more than 20. So, it is a good uh, level. So, but if 18.5 or to 20 and less than 20 is 2 that means BMI is become poor to poor. So, it is good at this point and the weight loss is 3 to 6 months the hello weight loss it, uh, within the 3 to 6 months less than 5 percent is ok because it can be achieved or it can be uh, covered with the food supplement 
and the 5 to 10 within one of the grade 1 that is it is also a moderate weight loss factor and more than 10 it is poor prognosis. So, there is there is definite there are some uh, disease like malignancy there are some disease like uh, severe malnutrition or severe dietary uh, disorientation. So, type 3 is the acute disease effect at a score 2 if there has been likely to be no or very little nutritional intake for 5 days. More than 5 days if a patient is nutritionally impaired there is due to some acute disease effect it is scored directly 2. 2 is a severe stage severe uh, scoring for any malnutrition or lo uh, loss of body weight. Now, here you can see the low, medium and high. Okay, routine clinical care can uh, can recover this uh, 0 uh, and overall risk of underneath that is medium observed. So, we can observe the patient and 2 is a treat. So, we need to treat the patient into the hospital or the good uh, managerial uh, process like you can see some how we can uh, routine clinical care that is hospital screening every week care in every month community in every year for special groups those who more than 75 years that means elderly patient more than 75 years has needs a special care like community care but in case of hospital every week so if a patient come to hospital in every week we can manage clinically on the other hand care of the home that we can send nurses or uh, healthcare providers to their home in every month and the community that is every year uh, a group of community uh, that maintains the geriatric medicine or geriatric uh, support the patient that will be uh, more than 75 years old patient that is an elder patient and obers that is observed the hospital the documentary dietary and fluid intake that means if the score is 1 then a documentary dietary and fluid intake within the 3 days can recover that patient from malnutrition but the care of the home as a for hospital community to repeat screening so we, so there are some screening programs so but or we can make other another screening programs to care that patient the one month to six months that is advice if necessary. On the other hand, if the score is two that is severe malnutrition, so we must treat the cause accordingly and that patient must be uh, treated in the hospital. So, refer to the dietitian or the impaired local policies and the general food first allowed and food fortifications and supplementation care from, from the hospital from the hospital. You can see the three kind of care hospital, care homes and community that must be provided by the hospital okay here also hospital here also hospital hospital is the only place where the grade 2 patients are treated now the you can see the if the height weight and loss cannot be established use documentation recall values when measure recall height cannot be obtained if neither can be calculated obtain an overall impression of so malnutrition risk clinical impression very thin thin average overweight so we can identify or classify the patient a very thin thin average and overweight and clothes and the jewelry have become loose fitting and the history of because the patient feels that his clothes become loose and the jewelry be, uh, are not fitted properly it is can be a sign of malnutrition or weight loss history of decreased food intake loss of appetite and dysphagia for three to six months so there are some symptoms like uh, there are some history of a decreased food intake, loss of appetite, and dysphagia, De disease, underlying cause and uh, psychosocial and physical disabilities likely to cause weight loss. Involves the treatment of underlying conditions health with food choice and eating when necessary. Now the fluid and electrolyte, first things first, uh, this is a lecture of fluid and electrolyte, so let us start. Fluid intake is derived from both exogenous and endogenous process. So, fluid that can be derived from exogenously or endogenously. So, fluid losses by the four roots. So, there are four roots that we can measure it, it, it is a fluid loss. So, let me clear this something. So, you need to make it much more harder for other processes. Okay. Okay, so the movie is starting. Okay, now this uh, one from the root, the 400 ml of water is lost in expired in every 24 hours. It means that insensible water loss, that is a term. 
that means sweating and evaporation these two uh, process is involved in the insensible water loss about 400 ml of water is lost like 350 350 skin in the temperature climate skin sweating loss are between 600 to 1000 ml per day so 600 to 1000 ml can be expired or wash out by the skin and lungs is 400 and the faces between 60 to 150 ml of water are lost daily it is overall 100 ml it is average in average 100 ml of water are lost daily patients with normal bowel functions now the urine the normal urine output is 1500 per ml per day provided that our kidney is healthy the specific gravity of the urine bears the direct relationship to the volume a minimum urine output of 400 ml per day is required to execute the end product of protein metabolism that means the nitrogenous waste product which is come from protein food protein derivative food so urea or the nitrogenous substance is the end product of protein metabolism so at least 400 ml of urine must be excreted in 24 hours to wash out the remaining nitrogenous substances okay now the average daily water balance of a healthy adult in a temperature climate 70 kg so 70 kg uh, a patient has some urine input and output chart this is an input output chart so input been water average 200 ml and water from food is 100 1000 and the water from oxidation is 300 so this three things uh, three amounts is uh, involved if, as an intake and output that is 1500 as the urine 100 as the feces and the insensible water loss as a 900 how that is uh, average from skin uh, of a uh, 600 and the lung as a 400 so average 1000 so insensible loss is about around 900 to 1000 uh, that amount that we cannot measure because that is evaporated by the breathing and the sweating that that amount we cannot measure so that's why it is called the insensible losses so this is a uh, average table of a bellies and loves now the composition of crystalloid and colloid fluid if a patient need fluid so we must select a uh, uh, important fluid or the necessary fluid for individual patient or with some individual diseases so not all fluid can be given to all patients so there are some contraindications and side effects of different fluid so here you can see some Hartman solution it has a sodium concentration is 131 potassium is 5 calcium 2 chloride 111 so in case of Hartman solutions called the Ringer's lactate, it is also called the Ringer's lactate solution. Why it is called Ringer's lactate? Because it has a lactate 29. So this amount is very important for MCQ and the chloride 111 or 131 sodium and potassium 5 and calcium 2. So these three, three or four or five things is very much necessary for MCQ. And the normal saline that is 0.9 percent sodium chloride solution that is the same amount of chloride and sodium 154 and 154 so this is isotonic fluid uh, it can be given to any patient uh, except the baby that means uh, small aged patient is contraindicated because they has a different fluid regimen and fluid calculation now the dextrose saline or 4 percent dextrose in aqua it is called dextrose so 30 sodium and potassium 30 dextrose saline is very uh, good for electrolyte impairment that is in case of sodium and potassium impairment and there are other fluid like uh, gelofusin 150 150 that is not used in our country because especially i do, i didn't see any uh, this kind of uh, fluid is used in clinically okay Okay, and the hemacyl and the uh, heta starch is called the hypertonic solution. So they has a more sodium content. So they are hypertonic, or they can increase the uh, blood osmolarity. Okay. So the fluid has uh, increased amounts of sodium amount and potassium is regarded as a hypertonic solutions, and those has 
uh, same same amount of sodium chloride uh, along with the plasma it is called the isotonic or if it is less uh, amount than the blood volume it is called the hypotonic solution. Now monitoring feeding regimes it is one of the important criteria that we assess or that we can uh, give supplementation by the way we can give supplementation to a malnourished patient this is a monitoring the feeding regime. So how we can give this micronutrients or micronutrients give to a patient with a particular amount of time as well. So this must be uh, regarded with some process with some uh, regime regimen. So we need to conserve some uh, regimen to make the things properly. So here you can see the daily body weight. So first we need to calculate the body weight and the fluid balance. What is the fluid status of the patient? Now the fluid so fluid balance can be or the fluid sense can be achieved by the pulse rate or the urine output and the gradual the sign of dehydration if a patient has a dry mouth or dry tongue or feeble pulses or the lack of sweating or a patient is lethargic or a patient has a vertigo or any uh, or, or any headache that patient might have and the low urine output or lack of adequate amount of urine output that might be a patient of dehydration. So fluid balance or fluid status must be maintained. Now the fluid blood count, urea and electrolyte, blood glucose and electrolyte contents and the volume of urine, air intestinal losses and temperature must be identified first. Okay, then weekly or frequently clinical indicator that is urine, plasma osmolarity, calcium, magnesium, zinc, phosphate plasma protein including albumin, liver function test, thiamine, acid base status and triglyceride. So these things must be uh, testified before fluid regimen. Okay. So what are the status of these micronutrients? So uh, you, must, you must maintain the uh, things properly, weekly. So you can weekly measure these things and these are the daily features, fortnightly. That means after four days, we can uh, have uh, fortnightly the serum B12, folate, iron, lactate, and trace elements like zinc, copper, magnesium. Why? Why it is uh, why it has been seen fortnightly because these things are stored in our body for a particular amount of time, particular amount of days to months. So that's why uh, it is not regularly seen. It is not. It is not needed regularly to how amount they are present in our body. So they must be watched out fortnightly. Now the macronutrient requirements. So it is look like clumsy but uh, it must be within a short here that what kind of carbohydrate, protein, fat, vitamin, minerals we need in a uh, in particularly for a day time. Like total energy requirements stable patient and normal morally like 20 to 30 kilocal per kg that is approximately 2000 kilocal per day okay carbohydrate so up to that within that carbohydrate there is an, an obligatory glucose requirement to meet the needs of the central nervous system certain hematopoietic cell because we all know that glucose is the only only supplement or only food stuff that a neuron conserve uh, so or the neuron uses as a metabolism okay so which equivalent to 2 gram per kg in addition, there is a physiological maximum amount of glucose can be oxidized at 4 mg per kg per minute equivalent to 1500 kcal that 1500 kcal per day in a 60 kg. So you can see up to 2000 kcal per day a patient uh, or a person can get nutrition 1500 from a glucose source or the carbohydrate source that is why carbohydrate is the main energy requirement of our body more more than three fourth okay and the diet in the rest of 500 are from the fat protein and vitamins like fat diet is triglyceride and the four lane fatty chain protein the basic requirement of nitrogen within the pre-existing malnutrition metabolic excess of 0 0.101.15 gram per kg per day is hyper metabolic patients the nitrogen requirement increase this party so the remain amount of 500 of 2000 kilocalorie are came from fat protein and vitamins 
whatever the matter of feeding these are all the essential components of nutritional elements the water soluble vitamin b c act as a coenzymes in collagen formations with wound healing post operatively the vitamin c requirement uh, uh, increases 60 to 80 mg per day that means 60 to 80 mg per day this can form a vitamin source okay now the fluid and nutritional consequence of intestinal dissection so all we know that the obstruction is important uh, disease one of the of the most popular disease that where this electrolyte and the fluid regimen is impaired so uh, due to some obstruction intestinal obstruction we need to resect the interstitium sometimes we need to cut out the jejunum ileum and part of the colon sometimes so in that case uh, the total fluid regimen are changed because their reabsorption capability or the uh, the reabsorption site are reduced than the normal so in case of intestinal res resection up to 50 percent of small distance can be surgically removed or bypassed without permanent deleterious effect that means if a 50 percent intestinal content is, uh, is removed if but there is still uh, there will be no permanent deleterious effect okay metabolic and nutritional consequence arise and resulting and decrease entirely known as a short bowel syndrome sometimes more than a lot of uh, intestinal content or, or segments if re, uh, a lot of segment is resected sometimes there is a problem or syndrome occur that is called the short bowel syndrome occurs the small bowel motility the small bowel motility is three times slower than the ileum than in the jejunum that means jejunum has a slower small bowel motility than the ileum it, it means so that adult small bowel is about 5 to 6 liters of endogenous secretions and the 2 to 3 liters exogenous fluid per day okay that means 5 to 6 liters of endogenous secretion occurred and the 2 to 3 liters exogenous secretion occurs per day it has been estimated that the efficiency of water absorption 44 percent to 70 percent of the ingested load in the jejunum ileum the ileum is critical in the conservation of fluid and electrolyte that means ileum has a lot of fluid reabsorption capability if a patient ileum resection occurs then so not only fluid but also there are some micronutrients uh, reabsorption will be impaired as well so for 44 to 70 percent ingested load of the jejunum and ileum uh, the ileum is a critical conservation of fluid and electrolyte so there is no alternative of ileum so ileum must be preserved in case and there are some patients who has uh, I ilocecal TB or ilocecal malignancies or ilocecal growth. In that case, a, a, a huge segment of ileum is resected along with the growth and along with the disease. So, there are some definite, definite some impairment of the, uh, with the full fluid and electrolytes along with some micronutrients. Here you can see the ileum. Ileum is the only site of absorption of vitamin B12, okay, very, very important and the bile salt okay vitamin b12 and bile salt which is reabsorbed by the in the ileum okay and the bile salt are essential for absorption of the fat and fat soluble vitamins okay bile salt is important elements of bile which is helps in uh, the uh, enterohepatic circulation so bile salt are maintained by the enterohepatic circulations uh, which is very necessary for absorption of the fat and fat soluble vitamins Following dissection of ileum, the loss of bile salt increases and is not met and increase in synthesis. So, the depletion of the bile salt pool results in fat metabolism. Loss of bile salt in the colon affects the colonic mucosa, causing reduction in the salt and water reabsorption, which increase stool losses. So, stool become steatoric, become uh, sticky, and uh, there is foul smelling, steatoria occurs because fat and uh, salt bile salt content is more in the colonic content due to some resection of the ileum and the colon the efficacy of the water and salt absorptions of the colon exceeds 90 percent first things first i want to show uh, to say that the jejunum is the most important part of fluid reabsorption so like 5500 ml of fluid that is reabsorbed through the jejunum so jejunum has a more capability of fluid reabsorption than the electrolyte because ileum has more 
intention for electrolyte measurement as, as well as fluid but jejunum is the absolute site of fluid reabsorption but it is above than colon but some people or some students think that colon is the site where the fluid reabsorption occurs uh, more but in case of intestine jejunum is the only place where a lot of fluid is reabsorbed the, it is the referred the reference from the ganon okay so efficacy of water and also exceeds 90 percent another important colonic function is the ferment and carbonates to produce short chain fatty acids now a clinical condition called the short bowel syndrome the resection of the proximal jejunum results in no significant alteration in fluid and light as, as the ileum and colon can adopt the absorb the increased fluid and electrolyte load but resection of the jejunum alone results in the ileum taking over the loss function that means if jejunum is lost ileum can adopt the fluid requirement fluid reabsorption process but resection of the jejunum alone no problem in this case there is no mal absorption but resection of the ileum results in the significant enhancement of gas motility and excess acceleration of intestinal transit following ileal resection the colon receives a much larger volume of fluid and electrolytes and it also receives the bile salt which reduces its ability to absorb salt and water resulting in diarrhea with large secretion uh, with, with large re resection more than 100 cm of dietary fat restriction may be necessary regular parenteral vitamin b12 is required but that means if the more than 100 centimeter of uh, large gut a small gut specimen is cut out in that case short bowel syndrome occurs in that case regular parenteral vitamin b12 is given the most challenging patient are those with short bowel syndrome who have had in excess of 200 centimeter bowel resected together the colectomy most challenging patient that means if more than 200 centimeter bowel resected in that case short bowel syndrome is eminent always so already resected together with the colectomy this patient usually have jejunostomy so uh, in that case patient will have a jejunostomy complication of short bowel syndrome include peptic ulceration related to gastric hypersecretion cholelithiasis because of interruption of interhepatic uh, cycle of bio salts hyper oxaluria as a result of increased absorption of oxalate in the colon so there there are the some the are the important problems or uh, complications of short bowel syndrome okay now the artificial nutritional support so now a, a patient is a fluid impairment so we need to make a uh, artificial nutritional support so how we can give this kind of support so you can see some pictures here uh, there are some process of uh, giving fluid to the patient exogenously like nasogastric suction nasogastric tube to the stomach up to the intestine whole food uh, feeding per uh, teaspoon feeding whole food by mouth and the gastrostomy tube so directly entry of a tube to the stomach and the jejunostomy tube so they directly entering any um, fluid to the so you can see here is a gastrostomy tube it is uh, by which you can give uh, fluid and this is the jejunostomy tube so it directly given to the jejunum okay so how we can know that the tube is in the perfect position so it, it must be seen by the radiography that is a chest x-ray so uh, sorry abdominal x-ray we can say radiograph of the tube similar to that the thing beyond the gastrojejunal flexure sometimes uh, the gastrostomy tube or the jejunostomy tube is in place to the uh, to the absolute positions so to identify the proper positions we can see uh, the uh, pictures by the radiography to see where the tube is placed and there are other things uh, directly into the uh, great vessel that is subclavian vein or sometimes external jugular vein these two veins is uh, given for central uh, parenteral nutrition and the peripheral parenteral nutrition there are two type of parenteral nutrition that is peripheral and central 
pantal nutrition. So, central uh, nutrition is given to the subclavian vein and the external jugular vein and the peripheral uh, nutrition is given in the cephalic vein as well as some um, radial vein also. Okay. Okay, now the enteral nutrition. So, the enteral nutrition that means the nutrition goes directly to the mouth to oral, fico oral loop that means mouth, through mouth. The term enteral feeding means the delivery of nutrition who into the gastrointestinal tract and the alimentary tract should be used whenever possible. This can be achieved when with normal food oral supplementation that is sieve feeding or with a variety of tube feeding techniques delivering food into the stomach and duodenum and jejunum. So, there are the, uh, this, these are the like sieve feeding that is teaspoon feeding that means and the percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy that means gastrostomy tube feeding and the it is called the PEG percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy and another was the jejunostomy. Now, the complement of enteral nutrition. So, there are some complications regarding uh, fluid to the gastrointestinal tract. So, what are the uh, complications that is the malpositions. So, the tube can be introduced in the uh, in different positions other than the gastrointestinal tract. Displacement, the usual position becomes displaced, blockage, it is invariably seen of a prolonged bed rest patient or the patient of gastrostomy tube for a long time. In that case blockage occurs and there is no other introduction of fluid. So, fluid given the fluid that given through the tube is obstructed due to the blockage and leakage. So, some, there are some uh, leakage to the tube due to some poor quality, some poor manufacturing uh, uh, manufacturing problems that is why or the poor amount of the poor quality of tube that can causes breakage and leakage and the local complication like erosion and skin mucosa some uh, it is percutaneous as it is a percutaneous process. So, there are some e skin irritation or skin lesion occurs and the gastrointestinal problem like diarrhea over over hydration or over uh, fluid can causes diarrhea, blotting, nausea and vomiting, abdominal cramp, aspiration. Sometimes fluid can be comes through the through the esophagus to the trachea and causes aspiration and the constipation. Sometimes adequate amount of fluid cannot be measured and in that case dehydration or constipation occurs and some metabolic and biochemical problems like electrolyte disorders, vitamin, mineral, trace elements, deficiencies and drug interaction as well and infective I, I, infective like exogenous and endogenous like hand handling contaminations because we can introduce the fluid but proper hygiene is not maintained sometimes in case the in that case inf infection is imminent and endogenous patient some patient may not tolerate this kind of gastrostomy or uh, endogenostomy there are some psychogenic problems or the patient feels discomfort or patients not well due to the fluid in that case it, it is a complication of enteric fluid nutrition therapy and now the parenteral things you can see there is a central uh, parenteral uh, nutrition process you can see the central uh, chain okay, that is uh, CVP line central venous line is uh, all made through the subclavian vein. So, it is subclavicular subclavian line it is a central line or CVP line which is uh, managed here. So, parental nutrition is indicated when energy and protein cannot be met by the internal administration of these substances. The most frequent clinical uh, indications relate to those patients who have undergone massive resection of the small intestine who have intestinal fistula or who have prolonged intestinal failure and other reasons. So, these are the patient selection. So, to, who, to whom we will uh, advise for uh, PPPN, PTN, hmm. total parental energy TPN so that is called. It is given central and peripheral loop. So, there are two, two kind of uh, line that we can make that is centrally and peripherally. So, peripheral feeding is appropriate for short term feeding. So, peripheral line is used for short term, line, but up to 2 weeks. For long term parental nutrition like Hickman's line that is subclavian or, or uh, it is a Hickman's line. Okay subclavian vein to the or the external jugular vein the line we made is called the Hickman's line is uh, preferable for long duration of action. An alternative technique for central intravenous access allows the PICC technique 
under ultrasound guidance. So, ultrasound guiding introduction of the CVP line that is PICC technique cannulate the cephalic vein and the arm which facilitate the massage passage of the catheter into the brachiocephalic vein or the supravena cava. That means, PICC technique which is done by the cephalic vein and directly a catheter introduced and up to the brachiocephalic vein and so or the supravena cava and gives the <laughs> total parental nutrition. Now, there are some complications of parental nutrition like hypoglycemia. So, related to the nutritional deficiency, if a proper amount of nutrition is not given in that case hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia and the uh, hypomagnesemia. So, these are the metabolic problems. Okay. These are also occurs in refeeding syndrome. Chronic high, uh, deficiency syndrome estimated fatty acid, zinc, mineral and trace elements deficiency. So, related to overfeeding. So, if these are the deficiency of feeding. If we give uh, additional or, or the give uh, excess amount of fluid or overfeed in that case hyperglycemia, hyperosmolar dehydration, hepatic statosis or the fatty liver disease that is called and the hypercapnia and increased sympathetic activity, fluid retention, electrolyte abnormalities these are the things occurs and the excess fat like hypercholesterolemia and formation of the lipoprotein X, hyperglycemia and hypersensitivity reaction. So, sometimes excess fat, hypercholesterolemia and formation lipoprotein X, triglyceride, hypertriglyceridemia and hypersensitivity reaction occurs. Excess amino acid leading, leading to hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, hypercalcemia, amino acidemia, uremia. So, because of increased protein fluid. Now, the related to sepsis. So, in case of TPN, there are some chances of sepsis like catheter related sepsis and possible predisposition of systemic sepsis and related to the lying like insertion of pneumothorax. Sometimes lying can be introduced into the lung and causes pneumothorax or damage to the adjacent artery nerves and causes air embolism, thoracic drug damage. Now, cardiac perforations sometimes gives to uh, directly to the heart, cardiac tamponade pleural effusion that means uh, accidentally the tube is goes to the pleural cavity and causes pleural effusion and uh, hydromediastinum sometimes the fluid goes to the mediastinum and causes uh, hydromediastinum long term use causes occlusion of venous thrombosis okay so uh, sometimes at last it is called venous thrombosis is occurs due to the increased amount of triglyceride or increased amount of parenteral fluid or Due to injection to the vein, thrombus is developed and ultimately that can causes venous thrombosis of or the occlusion due to the long term use of TPN. Now, the refeeding syndrome, because the patient uh, uh, underwent a lot of starvation for a long time. So, now fluid or electrolyte and fruit supplements is uh, going to be normal by the treatment. So, uh, uh, during the treatment there are some problems, uh, one of the important problem is refeeding syndrome. This syndrome is characterized by the severe fluid and electrolyte shift to the malnourished patient undergoing refeeding. When we are going to, uh, to treat a uh, severe malnourished patient, this refeeding syndrome sometimes develop to few individual cases. Like it can occur with either uh, enteral and or parenteral nutrition, but is more common with the latter. It is result of hypophosphatemia and hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia. So, these electrolyte disorders can result in altered myocardial function, arrhythmia, deterioration of respiratory function, liver dysfunction, seizure, confusion, coma, tetany death. So, these are these all can occur to a patient or in or few of the problems can arise or, uh, with the refeeding syndrome. Now, calorie deficiency, the delivery should be increase slowly and vitamin administered regularly. So, hypophosphatemia and hypomagnesemia require treatment. That means, these two things is must be remembered hypophosphatemia and hypomagnesemia is the key point that we need to give a patient uh, of a severe malnutrition because we all know that potassium and magnesium elements is present more to the tissue. That means, intercellular space or intercellular fluid contains a lot of magnesium and potassium as a major cation and a, and a, a lot of chloride 
a lot of protein okay and in and endogenous substances present as a anion in the fluid level that's why if a patient has a less amount of hypomagnesiumia or magnesium level or phosphate level that is that in that case we will regard it that patient has severe malnutrition patient or, or the patient need uh, additional treatment for this condition so thank you very much that is all about today's presentation or the about the fluid and nutritional therapy for from the Bailey's and Labs 27th edition uh, how uh, so the guys how you uh, think how you uh, so follow these lectures of the video uh, how you like my videos if you like the video please like comment and subscribe the channels that is med medical tutorial blogs and and virtual medical uh, blogs and tutorial class on the Facebooks and also the Instagram as well so if you have any questions so please uh, comment below and I'm, I'll try to give answers and uh, can we discuss later on about that so so keep continue watching and give me on your prayers thank you very much so uh, thank you very much for watching this video thank you so as a honeybee welcome to you all no problems thank you